Good day to you, Jason here, Birchfield Family Farm, Oxford, Ohio, running grass-fed, Red Devon cattle, St. Croix sheep and chickens, uh, all on a rotational grazing system here. I have a good word for you today. This comes from Zechariah chapter 1. Then I looked up, and before me were four horns. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, what are these? He answered me, These are the horns that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. I asked, What are these coming to do? He answered, These are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could raise his head. But the craftsmen have come to terrify them and throw down these horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter its people. Well, the day is finally here. Those of you that have been following know uh, we have too many bulls we're running here. Uh, that's become obvious here over the past few months. Uh, bittersweet day here. Uh, we are sending Mr. Big in uh, to the processor. Uh, Going to make some meat here and uh, really interested to uh, dig in and, and actually see, uh, you know, what kind of yields we uh, uh, get from that harvest. I want to take you around today and I want to show you kind of uh, our plan uh, for loading him and getting him over to processor. And uh, we're gonna do it a little bit differently than we typically load uh, just, just regular cattle uh, uh, without horns, uh, j just because of, of uh, those horns. He's not an aggressive animal. Uh, these Devons are very docile. But, uh, you know, uh, cattle do not like to go in uh, dark, uh, confined spaces. And so it can be a real challenge to, to get them on a trailer, uh, can be unpredictable. And uh, of course, the number one thing is staying safe here. So uh, let, let's head around. I'll kind of uh, give you a, a, a shot and some information, a big kind of show you uh, where we're at here and uh, uh, hopefully get him over the processor. So we have him in this little section here, right around, uh, we call it our hay barn. It was an old milk house here, but when we load, this is normally how we load here. Back a trailer and kind of cock it in here and come right in this way open this red gate and then open this green gate green gate opens this way and we put the trailer right right in there and there's not enough room on that side for them to to get out um and that that green gate's open to the the trailer we attach that to the trailer but then obviously what that creates is you know we have to find a way to get them from this area you know and up into that trailer and for a regular cow or a heifer you know or whatever something something hornless at least it's not really that big of a deal i mean give them a little growl a little push from the back and they they, they go up in there all right some of them are a little more difficult than others but you know with this guy here uh with those horns and uh, he, he is not he's not inherently aggressive um he looks like a mean dude but he's he's not uh, I just know if, if I get in there and we try to move him in the, uh, the conventional way that we normally do, I mean, he's, he's going to lower that head. He's not going to want to go in there. And, uh, you know, that also leaves me in there with nothing, nothing between me and him. And uh, I'm, I'm just not. I'm not going to rodeo. That's just not. That's not in the cards for, uh, for this go-round here. And so I knew uh, we had to come up with something else. So we came up with another plan uh, on the other side of the barn there. I'll walk around and show you, show you that. So this is, this is kind of the side there of the barn. And then we've got this cut out here. And uh, we load all our hay this way, bring that in. And just, you know, uh, going into winter, this will all be full of hay here. But, uh, you know, what we did here, I, I kind of had two rules as we went about brainstorming how to solve this problem. And my first rule was obviously safety. Uh, I want something between me and him all the time when we're, when we're loading and trying to force him on that trailer. Uh, force is not the right word. Put, push him, maybe. Um, and so what we did here, we've got two separate pens you can see. There's the first one that comes right off that little barnyard area. we got a feeder for the sheep here. There's a door on that side there that goes into this second pen. Now, we've got a gate back here that is hinged right here. And so it's gonna swing this way. And what we did was we just cut out, I cut out half of this pin fence. And I chained a gate there. And this gate 
is going to open. It's going to hinge there and open out this way. And so what we do, we figured out our, our livestock trailer can just barely fit through this opening. We have like mere inches on every side. We back that thing in and then I kind of kind of turn it this way and we open this gate and attach it to the far side of the trailer. And then my, my, my two rules, number one, were safety. And number two is I want something behind him like at every, I don't know, call them checkpoints or whatever you want. But basically the first thing that we'll do is we'll feed him in here and we'll get him in and we'll close this door. And then we have him in here. There's no going back. Then we'll bring him from this pin into the second pin. We'll close that door there behind him. And that'll be another checkpoint. We'll have him in here then. And then from in here, we'll swing, swing this gate over this way and we'll push him right down into this trailer. And uh, I think it'll work. Uh, you know, on the farm though, you, you just never know. Uh, come up with all these ideas and uh, you know, you gotta have something that works out here. So we're gonna give it a try and uh, see how this goes. Okay, so it is just after 12 noon here now. You can see big there in that little uh, pasture lot there uh, up front. I've got Sam uh, stationed just on the other side of this barn here, kind of out of his view. And I wanna go ahead with the first, uh, first stage here and I wanna bring big in uh, to pin number one. We have a window, a two hour window here from two to four today. Uh, again, just, just after 12 noon now. So he won't be in that pin number one very long. Uh, we could have kept him there all night, but I really uh, did not want to do that. Let's see if we can lure him in here with a little bit of feed and then shut that door behind him. And uh, we'll be ready to load out then uh, about 1.30. Okay, Sam. Set right down there. You're slicked off real well. Sam, Sam. Okay, let me feed him. Let me, okay, just stay there. Let me feed him again. Here, big. Hey, hey. Okay, try again, Sam. What was that bottom one? There you go. Excellent. <clears throat> go ahead and pull that top one shut too. Okay. So we'll go ahead and put some uh, put some more feed out for him just to keep him content in here. And again, he's only in here for hour, hour and a half, no big deal. What'd you think of that? That scared you when he whipped around? <laughs> Yeah, he's not he's not aggressive. It's just those horns. You know, he's lowered his head before kind of when you know, he gets in there in a confined space again when it's dark in a, a confined space. They just really don't like that. They want to be out in the open and I can't can't really blame them. Okay, we got him some feed and some water in here. Uh, one thing I will say that I've noticed, uh animals are much harder to move when they're hungry. And uh Especially over long distances, you know, they stop and, and want to eat and uh, just not as, uh, as easy going uh, when they're hungry. And so, you know, looking at him, looking at that triangle there, he's not looking bad. Uh, he could use a little bit of feed, though. The processor did not say anything about withdrawing any kind of feed ahead of time. So uh, I, I'm going to just I'm going to load him up, load him up and uh, he'll be much more content that way. Uh, not only loading here, but then on the ride uh, as well. You know, water's important. We're gonna be pushing 80 degrees today, so I'll keep, keep watering there. About 12.15 now. So we'll load here, uh, load out in about an hour. You know, I think one of the best things about the farm are just the stories that you accumulate over the years, right? The experiences that we have and those stories. I mean, those will be with you uh, forever and uh, just some pretty cool uh, stuff we've had happen to we, we haven't always had this livestock trailer here. Uh, we had an agreement uh, back in 2019 we were uh, Working with another local farm and they were selling grass-fed beef We were raising it for them and we were buying the animals up front and then we would uh, Sell to this farm and they would have them processed and they would sell under their label 
And it just worked out really well for both parties because they were also doing the transporting. And uh, we really, you know, we didn't really have truck or trailer or anything like that uh, back then. And uh, it was just nice to, to have somebody else to work with, you know, because we had the ground and the, we're set up for cattle already. And I uh, remember back in September of 2019, boy, we got in a tight spot. We had, we had purchased about five head of, of cattle and he was transporting them, had them in a trailer about this size and was on his way back uh, from, I don't know, an hour and a half drive or so. And he was, you know, 15 minutes away and called me up and said, hey, you're never going to believe it. Uh, I blew a tire on this trailer. He said, I have no spare tire. He said, I have called around and called and called and called and uh, nobody nobody has a tire. It was some kind of specialty trailer tire that, that nobody nobody had stocked. And uh, even, you know, AAA or whatnot, no, nobody had it. And he said, hey, it's, you know, it was like 95 degrees out. You're stuck on the side of the road. Cattle are in the trailer, uh, you know, panting. Uh, heat stress, no food, no water. We're in a, up a creek, man. I mean, I, you know, he's asking me what to do and this and that. And I, I said, well, I said, do you care if I say a prayer? <laughs> and he said, no. He said, go ahead. You know, I just just asked, you know, I said, Jesus, would you help us? We're, you know, we're, we need help. We don't know what to do. Uh, we, we need you to come through for us. And uh, I'm telling you what, we hung up the phone. It was not 10 minutes later, somebody pulled off the side of the road and stopped and looked at that trailer and said, hey, I think I've got one of those tires in my junk pile uh, at home. I mean, no joke. And this guy, he had a farm two, three miles away, ran home, got this tire, came back, changed it out. It was the right one, fit right on, and uh, got us got us back home, man. It was a, let me say, I'm gonna tell you, it was a joyous arrival uh, when he got back here to the farm. Uh, I will never, I'll never forget that uh, story uh, as long as I live. Uh, man, what a, what a stressful day, but, uh, you know, just seeing the way the Lord came through for us and uh, totally awesome. Anyway, I say all that to say we just had new tires put on this thing. Uh, run your spare. Uh, I don't know. You won't have as many stories to tell, but uh, it's, good to, <laughs> it's good to have a spare. It's a waiting game now. It is a waiting game now. You're right. It took, took me a few tries to get that trailer in there. Uh, you can see here, we uh, don't have a whole lot of room to spare, but that, that trailer just barely clears that top there. Okay, so it never fails here. We got big in pin number one here. You always gotta have a little bit of drama. So wouldn't you know it, in this hour that we have him in the barn, here comes the bull from the rented ground up here to rile everybody up, growling, starting trouble. Ugh. Now let's go in here and see if this is going to rile him up. Ugh. Okay, looks like he's staying fairly calm. How you doing all right in here? Oh yeah. There we go, there's that. There's that feed value, keeping him fed, keeping him busy. I know, you hear that moron over there? He's getting you fired up, isn't he? Don't take the bait, buddy. Okay, there he goes. Back from whence he came. Too hot up here. Okay, so one thing about our animals, they are just crazy crazy about grass and so we are going to take some clippings here and i'm going to put grass clippings at the very very front of this trailer just to kind of bait him so he goes all the way up when he gets in there he'll smell those and then also just to kind of keep him calm and eating uh, as we ride okay here we go 
ponytail too. And we'll have Sam hop in there. Sam's right on the other side of that wall there. When he comes through. Okay, Sam. Here. Here. There we go. Come on, Sam. Okay. Checkpoint number two complete here. Go ahead and close this behind him. Pull that rope. Okay, pull it. Not even a 10 minute drive to process or so that's good but i think you know having those two rules in place having something behind them you know to kind of keep your 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 checkpoint not give up your progress and also a gate between you and those horns a gate between you and the animal to keep things safe that seemed to work out Processor here, about 150, so 10 minutes early. Okay, there we go. Is this a scale in here? Yep. Okay. Come on, buddy. On the scale. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Where's the weight at? Twelve sixty. Twelve sixty. All right. Okay, so it is June 24th, and we just received a message from the processor that the bull uh, is ready for pickup. So let's head over there, see what we yield here on this harvest. Okay, so we have nine boxes here of product and I wanted to get you guys a measurement in case you're looking it's about 14 inches these are by me two and a half about six inches deep there you know we got nine of these so on, on freezer space kind of gives you an idea of uh, what you'd need one thing I do like about the way they do the ground here is it is packaged in square packages so it seems like those uh, those will stack uh, quite a bit easier than the tubes this is Frigidaire's 24.8 cubic foot uh, freezer here. Now these two stacks, there's a stack of three boxes here and a stack here. These are these are not uh, this this bowl here. Our meat is this one, this one, and this one, and those boxes are three high. So nine boxes total, like we said. She did order some some fat and some bones on top there, uh, just uh, for making uh, bone broth and whatnot. But uh, we'll go over uh, we'll go over final numbers. But this gives you an idea here on a 24.8 cubic foot freezer. Um, you know we're just we're taking up a little bit over half uh, for a full uh, you know what almost 1,300 pound uh, live animal. We could actually get a little more exact on space requirements. Uh, we we fit pretty snugly five stacks of three boxes in each stack right in that 24.8 cubic foot freezer so so you know we're using three-fifths or 60 percent of that freezer space to fit this full 
uh, bowl in there. So that would come out to, you know, 24.8 cubic foot freezer. You'd need 14.88 cubic feet of, of freezer space to fit this full uh, animal in there. So 15 cubic feet uh, for a uh, a full uh, Devon uh, bull here is the way that it, it works out for us. Now remember, we ordered mostly ground. And this ground here, I think we're doing really well on space because that ground is square uh, and it's packaged uh, with not a whole lot of uh, space in between. You know, you get the tubes, the one pound beef tubes, uh, those are not gonna stack as well as this. Plus if you have other cuts, you know, steaks, that kind of thing, uh, I would imagine that's gonna take up a little more a little more space in your freezer. Okay, so let's go over final harvest numbers here on the bull. You guys know I'm a numbers guy. Show me uh, where the rubber meets the road here. So we were 1260 live weight and we were 737.5 on the hanging weight. Now that's hot carcass uh, hanging weight. And the commercial producers in my area say you know, you really want to pay attention to that percentage there. And they say anything between 60 to 62% uh, is, you know, you're, you're doing, you're doing good. Uh, closer to 62, I think is what a lot of the, the producers around here are uh, shooting for. And, uh, you know, looking at, at big here, we came in at 58 and a half, almost 59%. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm really happy with that, especially uh, talking to another uh, local commercial producer, you know, uh, especially the fact he's grass fed, there's no grain. Um, and then also he's a bull. And so a lot of times on the bulls, you'll have a bigger, uh, bigger, bigger bone structure and whatnot. And, you know, he had some, you know, good size horns as well. So that all comes off to get that, that uh, hanging weight. And so at a 59% uh, hanging weight to live weight, I'm, 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 I'm pretty happy with that. I think we're, uh, we're right where we need to be on that. Live weight, 1,300 pounds. You know, that's a good, a good small framed animal. You know, that's what we're after here on the, on the grass. So I was happy to, uh, uh, to see those numbers. So let's talk about what we actually brought home uh, in usable meat for the, the harvest here. Uh, 346 pounds of ground, 23.13 pounds of brisket. Uh, wife had those cut up into four different sections uh, on that brisket, just easier to use. Total 14.16 pounds on the uh, rump roast. I think there were maybe four of those. Uh, and then we've, uh, we've got a friend that really likes oxtail, uh, 2.14 pounds on the oxtail. So 386 pounds of actual meat. So if you take that live weight, multiply it by 58 and a half percent, and then multiply that number 737.5 by 50, I think it was around 52%. That would give you your take home pounds of meat. Uh, let's talk some profitability numbers here. What, what do the, the, the costs and the potential profit look like on an animal like this? I tell you, get into a little bit of marketing here and just a little bit of uh, uh, economics and, and, and kind of uh, uh, cultural issues. I feel like you talk to any of the freezer beef uh, uh, families, families that are selling freezer beef right now, and they're going to tell you the same thing, and that is that sales are way, way down on freezer beef. And I think it's because uh, the consumer, the consumer, American consumer is strapped right now, especially middle class. Uh, tons of, of inflation uh, spiraling uh, virtually out of control here. And so that's really putting the pressure on the middle class. And I think, you know, people just don't have cash up front to go buy, you know, a quarter or a half a cow at one time. You know, you gotta have the, the freezer the electric to run the freezer. You got to have the cash up front to buy them. I mean, people just don't have it. And so we went ahead and had this guy USDA inspected and processed, which means uh, that I can sell by the pound. And I like that model because, you know, uh, folks can still support us with a, a one pound meat purchase. Uh, you know, they can come out here. And, and I think, you know, if I can keep my pricing pretty well consistent maybe with the top end of the grocery store uh, around here you know you've got organic beef at the store uh going for uh about eight and a half dollars you know regular junk meat is i think about seven dollars a pound and so you know we come in we come in with with grass-fed 
100% uh, grass fed with our, our mineral program that we run here, you know, being regenerative and uh, come in with a really high omega-3 healthy ground at $9 a pound. I think that makes us competitive. Uh, I really do, you know, paying just a little bit more uh, uh, to get a, a very high quality beef. So that's what we're going to do. I think we'll, you know, I'm going to price this at uh, $9 a pound here. And, uh, you know, when we do that, uh, that puts us at about $3,474 uh, just in a, a retail value. Okay, so hopping over to the cost side of things, uh, you know, what did it cost us to, to get this animal uh, to uh, a place where we can sell the, the meat? And uh, that would be primarily two costs for us. That would be processing, uh, and then of course our, our winter hay costs. Those are gonna be the two primary costs. A uh, little bit of, of, of water cost in there as well, a little bit of mineral cost. Uh, we will uh, throw a little bit extra in for that, but we're not we're not also talking about capital expenses here. You know, this is just operating. Uh, just to give you a ballpark here for, for you folks uh, looking, uh, kind of got your eye on grass-fed beef and what it might cost and what you could bring in. Uh, so processing costs were $890. Eh, it seemed a, a maybe a little bit on the high side to me, but... Uh, uh, you know, we have a new processor that opened up here uh, in just outside of town. It's very convenient for us just to just to head over there. We have paid less in the past, but uh, you know, uh, we did save some on on travel costs, uh, fuel costs. So eight ninety on processing our hay costs. Now here's here's where we get into an interesting uh, debate here, and I think you know on the grass fed side, I think this is really where we we messed up. And that is, you know, we originally got this bull as a second bloodline. I wanted to use him as a, uh, a second herd sire, and I kind of have two lines going, and that was based off of uh, our experience with sheep. And uh, that's kind of where we ended up with sheep, uh, just realizing that, you know, eventually you need another, another ram. And so uh, Mr. Big, as we called him, uh, was actually very small when we got him. It was a joke of a name, um, and, and, but he did turn pretty big. Uh, and uh, so anyway, uh, having him as a breeding animal, it just really didn't work out. I, you know, we had a few hits on selling him as uh, uh, a herd sire. And I tell you, nothing really came to fruition. Um, and I just also, I just didn't really have a good feeling uh, about him as a herd sire. Um, I don't know, just the, the, the horns. Uh, I don't think I'll run a horned bull from here on out. But uh, also... Um, he just had a few, uh, physical abnormalities that I just, I really didn't, I really didn't care for. Uh, that's probably another video, but, uh, anyhow, I get into, to our mistake here was kind of switching course, you know, after hanging on to him for, uh, four years, you know, he was a four and a half year old animal. And so, uh, you factor in those costs, you know, that second cost for us. I mean, we, we hate him for four, four winners. And so that really that really killed us. Uh, you know, at, at hay prices where we pay a hundred dollars a ton, you know, we had, I'm estimating about uh, north of $500. I'm, I'm estimating $550 just in hay cost to feed him out for four years. Uh, and so that processing of 890 and the hay cost of 550, let's do a total cost of 1440, but let's go ahead and just bump up to 1500 there, you know, add in a little bit of water and a little bit of uh, mineral cost uh, as well. And so I think 1500 is a pretty accurate uh, estimate for a, a cost on him. So again, you know, a retail value, uh, 3474 and a, a cost uh, to get him there of, you know, uh, around $1,500. It kind of gives you some ballpark numbers, you know, if you're you're looking at, at raising the breed or getting into uh, grass-fed cattle. How do we improve in the future? Well, I think uh, it comes back to what I had said about uh, on the grass-fed side, doing your calving in April and May. And I think if you can do that, and I think if we can get an animal two processor in you know 28 to 32 months uh I, I think it can really pencil out uh with, with buying your hay uh again i you know we don't make hay we we buy it in and at a hundred dollars a ton it's just it's really not worth it to me to to buy not just buying all of the equipment but all of the time that we would have in that 
uh, making that uh, hay as well. And so, um, you know, I think just if you could do that on the grass fed side with a steer or a cow uh, and get them to processor in, you know, I guess it would be more like a heifer, a uh, steer or a heifer, um, and getting them in and hitting that, you know, 1,100-ish pound live weight, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, only having two hay seasons in it, uh, I think that would be ideal. So, you know, those are some goals. That's, that's one more reason, right, to, to, to calve. If you're doing grass-fed, calve in the spring, and that way, you know, you can, you can run that animal out uh, for two years and then continue to run it out another, you know, four, five, six months to, to finish that animal out and just really put that focus on finishing that animal there when you hit, you know, July, August, September, and then getting that animal in before you've got to uh, feed out a third season of hay. So I think, you know, that's kind of where we'll dial things in. Um, I think, you know, running two bulls, uh, with what we're doing here it just takes more space you know I, I just i would need more space to separate bulls it just wasn't a fit for us uh much different than running uh two two bloodlines in the rams one of the other things worth noting here too we were advised by the processor to go uh, a little bit heavier on the ground side because this was uh, uh you know trending more towards an older bull uh, we were advised to, to do more ground beef really than anything else. Uh, he did say anything like that you're cooking low and slow, uh, like, you know, a roast or a brisket, that that tends to be fine. He did, he did kind of steer us away from uh, the steaks. And, uh, you know, when you talk about profit margin uh, on uh, the grass-fed beef here, you know, you really do have to have a conversation uh, about those steaks. You know, those higher dollar items are going to be your steaks, uh, your filet, you know, ribeye. Um, that's really where you're gonna you're gonna bring your money. And I remember we we've sold grass fed beef in the past, and I remember uh, telling my wife we uh, I, I, we had some what I thought was a ridiculous price on on filet, and uh, I told her I, I said I don't know mid twenties maybe a pound or something. This has been several years ago, and I told my wife I said there is no way anybody's gonna pay that for filet. That was the very first thing that we sold, and we sold out of it. Uh, could not could not believe that and so uh, you know that's that's worth thinking about here too You're probably going to have a higher profit margin on a uh, a cow a heifer or a steer uh, versus an older bull here uh, just because you can uh, you can do those uh, steaks and higher higher dollar items as well I always like to let things sit for a couple of days a couple thoughts from here you know I Wanted to say I did not include a, a, most of the costs to raising beef. I don't want to give anybody a, a wrong impression here. Uh, there are many, many, many other costs uh, to raising uh, grass-fed beef. Uh, you know, you got a whole marketing program to sell the beef. You, you've got fencing. You've got trucks, trailers. You know, I mean, you name it. Uh, labor is a big one, too. I did not mention any kind of labor you know, every farm has to decide uh, what their labor rate is. Your time's worth something. And so that's a factor too. This was just a very quick uh, analysis just to give you an idea on, on doing grass-fed meat. One other thought I had too, you know, you guys know I'm a big fan here of selling breeding stock. That's our primary enterprise here on the farm with our St. Croix sheep. Uh, we've had uh, some success with that breed and uh, just, just uh, have a real heart for just getting other homestead families off the ground, getting them going right with these sheep. They're just such a blessing and multiply uh, very naturally. And you know, looking at that on the cattle side too, I think there is a market there for very high quality grass fed stock and uh, selling those breeding animals. You know, you look around in my area right now, there's really not much uh, it's in the way of Red Devons, either heifers, or uh, bulls for, you know, you're not really gonna find much under two grand uh, to start out. And so, you know, look at my numbers here on me, right? Uh, you're, gonna be, uh, you're gonna be better off selling, uh, you know, uh, breeding stock if you can. Um, you know, gotta be high quality. Um, and, and, you know, that being said, uh, you, you're, you're not, you're only gonna be selling when you do breeding stock, you're only gonna be selling to one entity, right? If I'm selling this meat, there's going to be multiple customers in and out of here, quite a bit more marketing on the meat side as well. But, uh, you know, uh, looking down the road, 30, 40, 50 head of beef, 
uh, with the right marketing, maybe plugging into a few farmers markets. I mean, you know, I think there's a, you can do uh, pretty decently as a supplemental uh, income on the beef side. And so, you know, keep all that in mind. Um, you know, we kind of have talked meat versus breeding stock, and I lean more towards the breeding stock side of things. Just here on our farm, it seems to fit a little bit better. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, on the meat side, your meat uh, really, uh, it's only as good as it tastes, and uh, we haven't gone over that uh, part of it yet. Let's head back and put some of this on the grill. Okay, so getting the grill fired up here. You know, one of the myths you'll hear uh, from the grain-fed uh, beef camp is that grass-fed meat is kind of green or, or a yellow. I've heard, well, it's yellow and it's, you know, nasty looking and whatnot. Okay, here's what we got. This is grain-fed stuff right here, and this is our grass-fed from this bowl. I mean, look at look at how dark red. I kind of got it on a red plate there, too. But you can you can definitely tell a difference. No, no yellow or any of that that they say. I've been told just bull meat in general, the packers are always looking for bulls because it does look uh, redder. But again, grass-fed, grain-fed. According to Alan Williams, grass-fed will be 85% uh, more nutritious uh, than grain fed. I mean, you can you can definitely tell uh, a difference here and uh, excited to get into the taste on this. So definitely noticing a difference here as we cook. Uh, this is our grass fed meat over here. This is the grain fed meat. You can see the, just the flare up from all the, the grease. Uh, much leaner uh, on this uh, grass, grass fed side here. Moment of truth. I mean, definitely a difference we could see in the texture on the grill. It's good. I think we did good. What do you think of that beef? Good. Really? Okay. Everybody else? Good stuff? Yeah? All right. Was it gamey to you? No. I don't taste any gaminess either. Pretty cool. <laughs> you know, it looks like you're a clean plater there, bud. Nothing left. You having another one? <laughs> so uh, just a shameless plug here. Uh, if you're local to the Oxford area and you would like to support us, you like what we're doing here on the farm, uh, my email is in the channel description. Uh, get a hold of us. Uh, thanks for uh, hanging out with me today. Be blessed. Be at peace. Take care.